Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Cyber Coast to Coast. This is one of your co-hosts, Craig, here. Uh, I am coming at you from the, uh, actually, the west coast of Costa Rica once again, uh, the Tamarindo area. Um, and I'm joined again by my brother, Scott. Hey, Scott, uh, how's it going? Hey, what's up there, Craig? Doing well, and I'm here in uh, headquarters of Berkeley Veritronics, Metuchen, New Jersey, on the East Coast over here on a kind of a gloomy day, which is strange. We had a nice little heat wave for a while, and uh, now it's now it's kind of cooled off. It's, it's, it's about mid-70s or so here with a little bit of breeze and a little overcast, so it's kind of nice and pleasant. Oh, yeah. Well, I wish we had a visual podcast because I would give a quick tour to our um, listeners <laughs> or and our viewers in that case and you uh, we got a really sweet setup here uh, we moved into this place in Tamarindo we got it for one month and right. um, you know just a hundred feet away from the from a beautiful beach surf, surfing all that stuff and we even have our own little gated in private pool and wow. um, like a lot of extra rooms that we don't need it's, it's kind of crazy our own nice grill for cooking and oh, uh, we, even, we even got our own outdoor shower when you come back to the beach and you're all sandy and you, you know do your feet oh, and your whole your bathing suit and all that stuff so <laughs> we're we're living it up here for for, for now uh, things could change though we had a crazy storm here the oh, other boy. day it was i'll send you some video on it it was cr- like i was in a it, it's like a kind of a strip mall but it's covered and things were blowing over people everyone had their phones oh. out they were recording it because it was like a serious flash flood, lasted about a half an hour, and then it rained for another three hours after that. Like we were, I had to drive home from shopping. We were driving to a foot of water, and the the cabbie, the you know the guy, the Uber driver, he he just kept saying like, he's like, this is crazy, this is crazy, but that's the wet season here. It's something. The entire town was flooded. So um, that's crazy, but, man. Yeah, but then the sun is also so intense here. It, the, by the next day, it was dry. Everything was dry and the water was all gone. You'd never know that it rained because it just evaporates everything and the water runs off and disappears. So, Wow. Uh, that's yeah. that's kind of neat, though. I guess it's nice. It reminds me of uh, Florida a little bit. You'll get like a passing storm at a certain point. It gets real hot, then a passing storm, then it cools off a little. And Interesting. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah, crazy, crazy weather systems we're getting used to here. Um but whatever. In any case, yeah. let's uh, let's get to the show. Um, yeah, let's dive got, in. Yeah, we got three uh, three solid stories today. Uh, first one's about a big data breach, another U.S. government data breach. Uh, we'll give you all the details on that. Uh, we got another one coming out of uh, Hacker News one about the SEC, um, and uh, it's, this, is, this is more about a kind of a reveal, a transparency. For companies that were attacked and when they should reveal it uh so we'll, we'll go through some of those details and step people through and uh third story um this one's more about the law enforcement uh buying uh data brokers they data from data brokers on people it's kind of a workaround how they get around the uh, constitutional amendment of you know privacy and all those things uh so we'll step into those details as well uh but first, uh, let's just do a, we'll do a quick, um, quick mention. We, we've been doing this, this segment on um, AirTag related news and things for a, a few weeks now. And uh, this one isn't so much news because I've seen this pop up before, but I just thought it was interesting because we're seeing an increase now of um, parents using AirTags to keep track of their kids. Um, we, uh, I remember a couple years ago well if people want to go to read the story you can see it all over because a lot of people are you know talking about this but uh insider.com and we'll have the the link in the show notes uh but i remember a couple of years back when the apple watch was introduced and you had parents saying well i'm not going to buy my kid a phone but i'll get him a watch that way i can Mm -hmm. track the watch and (laughs) maybe and do some kind of crude communication with them too if they have wi-fi or you know something like get him a cellular watch and that kind of thing. Uh, now, now they're kind of stepping down, way down to air tags, and just saying like, "Well, I could put it. I guess I could slip it in my uh, child's, you know, backpack or something." And I'm, while I'm tracking their bag, I'm also tracking them. So, you know, what's the harm? Uh, 
I don't know, Scott, you're a, you're a parent. Did you ever, you know, what, what do you think about this stuff? Well, it's funny, funny you mentioned it because it, it literally something similar crossed my mind, not exactly with, uh, an air tag per se, but, uh, we were just watching TV downstairs and it was late last night. And my son says, Oh, the, you know, just wanted to hang out. Some people are hanging outside the house out front. We're on a cul-de-sac quiet neighborhood. We know all the neighbors. So it's fairly friendly and all. And he went out and he was out for a while and he said, we're just going to take a walk. And I, my mind instantly, my paranoid mind says, Oh no, what happens if something happens? I said, Oh, make sure you're careful. Do you have your phone on you? Yes. This and that. And what did I think about was, well, if there is a problem, at least I can look down on the find my app and see where his phone is, where he's at and, you know, mm-hmm. help him if there's trouble. But I could see why parents would maybe for younger children, um, mm-hmm. especially in, in um, elementary school or something like that with a backpack and all the craziness in this world would want to just drop a tagging because it's a lot cheaper than having a, a phone and subscription and, you know, they lose the phone or this or that. An air tag is simple. Drop it in and you have peace of mind. It's worth the $30 for an air tag or whatever it is and how simple it is in the, in the ecosystem of Apple. So I think it's a, it's a brilliant idea. I guess if I understood right, this article is kind of showing a little bit of the, the negative side, how it kind of maybe conditions children to think differently about security and parents relationship on spying on them and some other things like that. Could it, actually hindering, I think is the term they use the development of a child, a story like this was talking about. And I, I don't, I don't see how that could exactly happen. I guess if the parents paranoid and needs to check in every five seconds, but those type of parents do that with a cell phone. Anyway, they're constantly right. calling their kids, text me when, they, when you're here, there. And, um, as a parent, I do that a little bit, I guess, but it's more, you know, Hey, if you need anything, holler or you know shoot me a text or ask a question but we're not constantly monitoring our phone and watching their every move and tracking them and trying to figure you have to have a level level of trust it's earned and um i think that's probably a balancing act from child to child because some you probably can't trust and they won't tell you where they're going and they're doing things behind your back then i could see why parents would be paranoid so it's definitely a fine line but it i think it's i try to look at it it's, it's a positive tool that parents can use the tracking tags and things, but at the same time, are are they transparent? Do they tell their kids? I mean, I don't, I don't hide tags in my kids stuff and track them without them knowing it. Right. You know, I, I, you know, if we're on the find my network, I say, everybody, I said, Hey, you could see my phone, you know, where I, where I am at all times, you know, where dad is and vice versa. We all, we all watch and see one another. If there's a problem, help one another. That's okay. I think. Right. So, you make an agreement. You've all got nothing exactly. to hide. So why mm-hmm. not just for safety's sake, in case something does happen un- unexpectedly, it, exactly. it is good to, to be able to keep track of it. And it, like you, you brought up a good point too. Um, you know, the, these kind of, uh, helicopter parents, they call them, you know, cause they're always hovering over their kids and constantly pinging them and seeing what they're doing. You know, that you can track your child's whereabouts with an air tag, but you're not really tracking anything important which or something as more important, which is their emotional state. You know, when you have a, when you can, when you can see the metric, when they have a phone and I'm not, you know, saying that all five-year-olds should get their own phone or anything, but when uh, younger children have phones, you get a lot more metrics than just their whereabouts. You can see what apps they're doing. You could, you know how much time they're on the phone and you could kind of, you know, determine their emotional state or something because because you can talk to them or send them a text or you like i said you just know how much time they're spending on the phone whereas you know an air tag it's just like okay they're here they said they were going to be here and it looks like they're here instead of, oh you know so they lied to me and then it yeah it's it's more of a it seems like more of a, a way to um enforce a punishment or almost a form of entrapment in a sense if they you know mm-hmm. they agree to it and now they're kind of walking into it and mm-hmm. um you know and maybe some you know some parents feel the need you know their kids are delinquents who knows um uh, yeah. maybe they want that but i don't think it's it doesn't seem like a good thing for just you know the broad spectrum of kids out there because it's it's, a, yeah. it's kind of a limited very cheap tool um it's 
it could be harmless and it could it's definitely uh comes in handy especially if you go somewhere as a family a group like an amusement park and then you split up and then you come you know you say oh we're gonna meet here and oh there they are you know that kind of thing um exactly yeah it's a case it's a case it's like everything else you know it's a case-by-case basis if you trust your kid enough to use a phone great if you trust them enough to use a watch great if you trust them enough to just have the air tag that's fine too but there has to be that um there has to be that trust and that communication between the parent and the child, I think, to make it truly you know, effective tool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree there. And if it helps for other parents listening into this, what, what did help me sell it, I guess you could say. So, so my, my kids understood, I, I did say, Hey, look, as part of the, the family share, the plan that's under Apple, since we all have iPhones and watches and the laptops and, the, and you know, we have air tags and other things, tracking some of our, stuff if we travel um i said with the family share you also have access because we have a plan with the music uh it's tied into the apple tv so if you want to see a movie and you'd listen to it on your airpods and so on and so forth so it becomes part of that whole ecosystem they're part of it and they have access they want to hear a song or a certain music genre in the car they just tune daddy out and they, they could listen to that and that that's fine for them and but but what comes with that is kind of the the knowledge that hey we, we are tracking one another and looking out for one another. That's how I kind of sold it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, and speaking of uh, tracking and, and tools, I noticed uh, we, we began, we just began to ship our, our uh, Blue Sleuth Light, which is an air, tra- air tag tracker of sorts. And you had uh, someone reach out to you on LinkedIn. Tell us a, a little bit about that. Yeah, actually, that it's timely. It just happened today, and and you're right. We just started in the past a uh, little more than a week. We started shipping uh, our first wave of blue sleuth blue sleuth light um, product. We had the Kickstarter uh, back in February or whatever. Great success and response. Great feedback. We've we've since been adding so many features. It, it's the usual side. The design side is always more. Uh, challenging than you ever think and and yeah certainly we ran into some bugs but we also got some great feedback from the community saying wow it'd be really cool if you could do this if you improve that if you also had that so we spent a lot of time the past couple months really refining the product and and i look at this almost as more of almost consumer like with the features and functions but it's really designed for two audiences because as you know because you help design a lot of the screens and and the look of it we've got a very basic mode for your more average consumer daily user but then we got a pro mode for somebody that's a private investigator or tscm technical surveillance countermeasure or somebody that that does ex- executive protection detail things like that so we've got uh, customers more on, on the higher end and more basic consumers that are just nervous for for Hey, I, my wife's being stalked or tracked. I want a little device to make sure that there's no tags put in the car for more peace of mind to somebody that's providing services, actually sweep vehicles. So we've got kind of two extremes. Any event, one of the first ones that shipped just recently um, was to a customer that does uh, a lot of executive protection and, and technical surveillance countermeasures. And uh, and I'll just read it if it's okay here. I'm not disclosing any any anything because this was public information i i just actually stumbled upon it on linkedin and i saw a picture of the units this is great what a nice compliment it said i added a new tool to the toolbox today i have to say it's the best ble tracking tool i have small fast and accurate if you're on an executive protection detail you need one of these slip it in your pocket and know right away if you're being tracked with a bluetooth low energy device scott and team over at berkeley have hit a home run with this one. Thank you, Scott, for making my job easier. I said, wow, that's great. What a nice little compliment. And to, and to kind of see it, and it's unsolicited, and I didn't reach out and ask him to write this. or see, I'm just checking in my LinkedIn feed, as I normally do, and saw a picture of the unit, which caught my eye. And I'm like, hey, that's our unit. Next thing I know, I saw this nice little compliment that he put out to his, um, to his community of people in the technical surveillance side and private investigators and stuff like that so n- nice to see feedback from uh actual users out there and i continue i welcome that feedback and not just good praise always i i, I welcome back good and bad because i think one thing that we've learned being in business now we're over 50 years our customers are really our business their voice is what shapes our product and improves our product 
we might have a, a decent idea, sometimes even a great idea, but it becomes superior when the customers give us that valuable feedback, the little tweaks, how to make it better, the right color, the, the right way to scroll down a menu or a, a unique feature that only our product has perhaps. And we try to Im, Im, embed those to make sure we're making the best products for our customer base that we can. So to me, that's the key. Listen, listen to the customers. That's how you make great products. Not, not anything that you come up with necessarily. You might have some great ideas, but ultimately the customers really have to drive it. Yeah. It's, it's very easy to get, stuck in a, you know, we're kind of a design engineering company. So it's very easy to get stuck in a bubble here in your yes. own thoughts, your own head and think your way is the only way or your way is the right way. And a lot of times there's more than one solution to a problem. And sometimes they're even more elegant from people that you would, you wouldn't expect would know or, or, you know, positive theory. So it's oh, yeah. great to get this kind of feed, feedback, you know, maybe, who knows if we, we start shipping enough of these things, we get enough feedback that could become our new segment on this podcast. You know, yeah, the, the blue suit like feedback for the week or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. No, it does work. We're, we're developing a new product. It's, it's kind of um, at a cool stage right now. And I literally made a mock-up and I walked around the building over the past week and I handed it to random employees and I said, what do you think? And I've got the most interesting feedback from some of them. Everything from, I don't like it. It's a dumb idea. Too heavy, awkward, hurts my wrist. You know, old, and, it, and it's an integrated one-handed solution with direction finding tool for, for a new product we're launching, which is pretty hot. Um, but in the process, I got three things from employees that to me were golden gems little tiny tweaks that make it much better. And then once just today, in fact, uh, started talking about, they said, you know, I bought these little mounts for a GoPro used for my motorcycle helmet to the camera. What about that to mount the unit to the handle, to the direction fine? And we started talking it out. And hence we, we got some samples coming in early next week. And I said, what's wrong with looking at how other people do things? Like GoPro has probably spent millions of dollars perfecting they're mounting brackets, ruggedized, lightweight, flexible, and integrate their accessories into some of our products. Um, so, so I'm often a, a big champion of look at what other people have done really good and successfully. And, and I'm not one to say, let's just copy their idea, but rather use it. Give them the money. They're, they're selling the bracket. They charge a dollar for it and you can buy it off the shelf. Just integrate something that's proven technology that works really good instead of trying to get into their business, we're not going to be making millions of camera mounts or anything like that, but here's somebody that really knows what they're doing, how to make the best one integrate it into your product to give your customers the best experience that you possibly can. Yeah. Very good true. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's get into the first story, but uh, yeah, sure. before we, before we do just want to mention that our, uh, this week's sponsor is dark kryptonite. And they stop ransomware, malware, and phishing in their tracks, eliminating cybercrime, fraud, and info warfare. Uh, they use the advanced blockchain algorithms and zero trust models to accomplish this. But you can, I think you get a better sense if you go on their website and see for yourself. Uh, they just updated it, I think. More information on there now. There's a, there might even be a, a mention of us somewhere on there. Uh, go to, uh, darkkryptonite.com kryptonite is with a c like like crypto um okay first story uh this one comes to us from bleepingcomputer.com and eight million people hit by data breach at u.s government contractor maximus um never heard of maximus but apparently they're one of many many contractors that our, our uh, government uses and uh this one Specifically, was a, a zero day flaw in a Move It file transfer application. Move It, it must be a brand of a uh, you know file transfer application. You, you, mm -hmm. uh, there's what we 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 transfer. Uh, I know that one I use sometimes. Mm -hmm. There's Fetch It and all that kind of stuff out there. Um, so many of those things, and I guess when you get a zero day flaw, uh, you can move in and uh, grab a lot of information because you're the nature of those applications is that you're sending a lot of information 
Um, mm-hmm. and that doesn't help any matters. Uh, looks like, uh, social security number, some protected health information, some personal information, that kind of stuff, uh, was possibly, uh, breached and, uh, scraped. Um, I don't know mm-hmm. if we, uh, but it's, uh, it's eight, the headline says eight million, but they claim eight to 11 million, yeah. uh, in, in kind of the breakdown. I don't know if you, Remember, this reminds me a little bit of the, uh, what is it, the OPM? The, uh, yes. we did a, we did a chapter, uh, about that in our, in our book. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what do you, what, what do you think, Scott, on, on a scale of like, let's say OPM is, is the worst case? Where, where does this fall on that scale? How, how bad do you think this sounds? Um, well, OPM was, was pretty bad. I, I mean, that would probably, uh, be in a higher level you know if it was a zero to 10 10 being uh the worst i'd put opm at like 11 (laughs) um it was so bad and and that was over 22 million records the opm breach and this was that goes again back in 2015 and we wrote about it in the book um you know uh, sometime later but those records were a little different because they were specific to government employees um, that went under uh, background checks. And so it tied to them, their immediate family, and their closest friends. And it was fingerprints and a whole bunch of other things beside the normal name, social security address, phone number compromise. So the a- OPM one was about double the size of this one. Um, but to me, more personal information. And that's what made that one really stand out. Whereas if you look at what Maximus does, Um, And we deal with a lot of these government contractors uh, one way or another through some of the products that we do sell, but not really Maxima specific. In this particular case, they focus their 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 uh, core is really tied to Medicaid, uh, Medicare, healthcare reform, welfare, student loan services, a couple other select government programs. So it's kind of a niche that, that, that they work with, with government programs and contracts. So yes, it does have personal information. Cause again, especially tied to that, I call it the healthcare type of sector because, um, healthcare breaches and healthcare type of, um, scams are very lucrative, you know, mm-hmm. I, identity theft, you can make a certain amount, but if you're doing falsified uh, claims for insurance and things like that, and you need different codes and personal information for people, there's a lot of fraud going on in that sector, especially in that Medicaid and Medicare, the government just can't keep up with. So this is a very rich data set of, of stolen information, that 8 to 11 million people that they got. And that's probably how they're going to really make money on it. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, uh We'll keep an eye on. I, I I just noticed looking at the stories. I this is a maybe subconsciously. Uh, these are all the stories this week are all kind of they involve government um, hacking regulations, uh, bill proposals, and all that kind of thing. So we have a U.S. government themed uh, news story feed this week, I suppose. Um, you know, let's jump into the next story. Uh, before we do, just want to quickly mention once again. Uh, dark kryptonite. Uh, if you want to, if you believe your, uh, email address might be appearing on the dark web, you might want to contact dark kryptonite, uh, because they do all those, those kinds of forensics looking all over the dark web, finding where, uh, stolen passwords and credentials are that might relate directly back to you. So, um, I would, uh, contact darkkryptonite.com. Uh, for more information, find out about all their services. New SEC rules requires U.S. companies to reveal cyber attacks within four days. Um, we've heard about this for for years. Uh, uh, more transparency is needed. Uh, things like that. Uh, it seems it seems that the U.S. Uh, compared to other countries is pretty. Uh, pretty conservative about this stuff though you know four four days meanwhile uh the eu uk canada south africa australia they have a 72 hour uh window maximum window when uh, a cyber incident needs to be reported and uh in the east china and singapore it's only 24 hours uh and india is only six hours so they're very uh 
they're very strict about that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know. Do you, you think it is, is four day? I, I understand a lot of it is, uh, due to, um, well, okay, here, here's the thing. And, uh, part of the wording of this, uh, is it's one of these devil is in the details because, uh, mm-hmm. they say cyber attack within four days of identifying that it has a material impact on their finances. So that the criteria is kind of set by the company itself which doesn't seem fair. That could be very biased. And also they're setting the terms, you know, a ma- yes. material impact. You know, what is, what does that mean? That means different things mm-hmm. to different companies, to different people. And I'm sure your CFO and your, your CISO are going to say it's a, it's a material impact. We can't, we can't reveal this for a month at least, you know, and you think, yeah. four, you know, and four days might be, too much the damage might be already done and more damage could be inflicted to other vendors and other companies as a result of withholding this information uh what do you think is a is there is this a one size fits all or we're just gonna have to take it for now i guess four days for for u.s companies yeah i guess i'm i'm not not a hundred percent sure and i do think no one size doesn't fit all is not always you know, it's probably a good way to say it because you think about it. Imagine it's a a large banking institution with you know tens of thousands of employees. That's very different than a small business that's got twenty employees. You know, they may have a cyber department with fifty people. Your company may have no cyber department. So it's certainly going to vary greatly. It almost needs to be that they have to distinguish between small, medium and large size business versus enterprise or kind of put some classifications in there because that's a little bit more realistic based upon uh, what time you should respond. A lot of it too is is you, you should have to really contact the government and share with them that you believe there's a breach. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go public all the time and tell everybody because they may tell you keep quiet about it. Hey, we're going to help you negotiate a ransomware settlement, or we have a company coming in that can do some forensics about this. I think this generally is really talking about publicly traded companies there, which are generally larger companies uh, to be on the the stock exchange and and so on and so forth. You, You got to spend a lot of money to stay listed and all. So I can understand maybe four days, maybe that makes a lot of sense there, but Maybe to add to it, I think to your point before, you made an interesting point. I just wanted to piggyback on it. These stories talk all about government and data breaches, which I think is interesting. If you follow some of the other headlines that recently came out, and it's really been the past month or so, there's been a lot of talk about U.S. cyber force. This is going to be a new um, uh, uh, U.S. military segment that's going to that's gonna grow very quickly and this is akin to the, you know the army navy air force marines space force which is a newer one that came up in the past few years now there's going to be a cyber force us cyber force and what does that tell you it tells you there's that many problems i'm just making a general blanket statement without giving away things or saying anything specific but the us government's dealing with a lot of cyber issues a lot of breaches and they're helping a lot of companies at different levels um, to prevent catastrophe and they said that the the budget for this u.s this the proposed budget for u.s cyber force is close to a trillion dollars that wow. they're, they're planning on handing out a trillion dollars to start out that is a huge amount of money and perhaps that is why we've seen with our business and again we, we focus berkeley Veritronics making a plug here uh, we make wireless threat detection tools and we do sell to many government agencies um, to keep things safe and stop cyber threats, usually when it's a wireless conduit. Um, and that's why we've seen increase in spending. And looking forward, I, I see a lot of this too, because there's so many problems. There are so many problems, different government sectors being targeted and attacked, critical infrastructure, and the government helping different sectors of the business world to to remediate these things. And CISA, um, that division has been doing a lot. They've been very active in the space. And I think doing a lot of good between educating, raising awareness, um, sharing a lot of things, uh, tips and things for businesses to be proactive and not become victims. So a lot has been done just in the past year. And I think a lot more based upon how much money is going to be spent in the world of cyber. So I think in the next few years, 
the U.S. is probably going to come out of it as far as a country that is going to have a very strong defense protecting uh, everything and anything to do with cyber. Yeah, and um, you, you mentioned cyber force. And if you just look at who's uh, implementing these rules, it's not a security company. It's the SEC, which yes. they really have, a you know, they, they care about finances. And yes, you want your financial transactions to be secure. But, you know, how we always say, um, don't build your product or don't build your company with cybersecurity as an afterthought build it from the foundation. And I think this is more of a uh, SEC kind of latching on to, hey, let's add some, let's add some security rules. They're not, they're not going to redo their entire um, institution. Uh, they're not, it doesn't sound like they're forming some kind of big panel of experts to decide mm -hmm. uh, on the fair use of these rules. And they're certainly not commissioning cyber force to implement these rules. They're doing it themselves. So it's, it might not be a, a fully secure measure, and it might may, maybe eventually they will hand off some of this to an or something like a cyber force or something that's hopefully a non biased entity that that has an expertise in security, and, you know, this specifically the security of bits and bytes. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's that just springs that just jumps to my head that it, it's the same old thing. Like let's. Let's throw let's throw let's throw some security into the mix and call it a day, and hopefully that will fix the problem. And you know we'll see. Maybe maybe this four maybe four days is enough. Maybe the the rules that uh, the transparency complies with are enough. Um, I, I guess we'll see how that works out for these publicly traded companies and the economy as a whole. Yeah, um, but I do do think if they don't do something, then nothing gets done. Without putting mm -hmm. some pressure or specificity on reporting times or other things, you got to have some realistic rules that will make people, make companies, make business leaders, especially these publicly traded companies, they got to respond. Because in the past, too many of them um, buried their head. And, and we wrote about some of these with, with Uber and the likes. And when they were hacked, they covered it up by calling it a bug bounty when it was really a... a a ransomware payment and other other creative accounting measures companies have done publicly traded companies and uh it, it doesn't fly anymore they have to be accountable because they have to answer to the public their shareholders and their customers so i'm, I'm glad they're putting some rules and regulations in um to, to make things more transparent that's really the bottom line yeah uh our next story um before I get to it, I uh, just want to remind listeners once one more time, Dark Kryptonite stops ransomware, malware, and phishing, and they track eliminating cybercrime, fraud, and info warfare. And they do that by utilizing blockchain algorithms and zero trust models. And you can learn more on darkkryptonite.com, kryptonite with a C. Um, let's see, this one, this next story, this is really, uh, I guess, a a true story about the government because of it comes from the hill.com which is mm -hmm. pretty much only political stories mm -hmm. and um putting uh it's called putting a price on privacy ending police data purchases so it's not a it's not something that has uh, it's not a law that's been passed already it's not nothing has changed yet it's a proposal um it's the Four, what is it called? The Fourth Amendment is not for sale act. <laughs> they always try to come up with these catchy, stupid yeah. proposals, but I guess they couldn't make an acronym out of this one. So it's just a not for the Fourth Amendment is not for sale act. That's a new bill. And um I guess what it what it's generally trying to do is prevent um uh uh people from uh track People prevent citizens from being tracked or, or suspects from being tracked through the use of data brokering, um, which is essentially a workaround for legal warrant that law enforcement are supposed to use. So you got these cops saying, well, either we don't we don't think we're going to get the warrant because it's not justified or it's going to take too long or whatever. And if you pay a fee to the right data broker, they'll say, well, we have information on this suspect's phone. They were, you know, here's all their metadata. 
Now, you're not getting end-to-end -end encryption information, but a lot of times you don't need that information. All you need to do to prove that someone is could be uh, you know, in the vicinity of, of a suspect at the time or you know, kind of guilt by association data the, is this metadata. Um, it's, uh, let's see, geolocation isn't just being used for military operations, but rather to track, track crimes as mon mundane as tax, tax evasion, uh, border protection, immigrant and customs enforcement. So you got a lot of different government mm -hmm. branches using this kind of uh, metadata. Um, so they're getting, they really are getting around the, the Fourth Amendment uh, by paying a fee. And, you know, you really shouldn't be able, I guess that's the, the thing about the Constitution and the amendments. There shouldn't be any price that, that can be paid to get around them because that's kind of the point of them. They're supposed to be, you know, sacrosanct and, and it's the, the rule of law and all, all those things. Um, I don't know. What do you, what do you think about this, this bill and this, this, this issue? Well, I, I do think this is a little bit of a, a, a challenging one because it, it crosses into the world as you started out nicely saying, and it's just kind of political. So everybody's going to have a strong opinion on it this way or that way. I mean, from my perspective, again, non-political view, because, because I'm kind of neutral, but uh, well, I am neutral, I should say, but um, I look at it this way. I, I, I like privacy. We all like privacy and we deserve a level of privacy in the country that we live in, even though you're in a different country right at the moment, but there, there, there's a, a perceived and expected level of privacy. And clearly with the, the laws in place and all the loopholes, there's a workaround just about everybody has found through social media, through apps, through tech, backdoors and other things, but we really do not have privacy. Um, that being said, does that bother me? Sure. I want a level of privacy, but at the same time, I don't think it's fair to make it difficult for law enforcement and make it challenging so they can't do their job. It's kind of, I always think about it like it, it, you ask a, a police officer to risk their life to protect you and you're giving a, a cop a gun with no bullets almost because they have cameras that watch the police and rules they have to follow, but the bad guys do whatever they want. So I think there has to be some balance, some transparency between the two. And the same thing here, um, should police be able to just throw money at it and get data and work around it? No, that's not right. But they should be, they should have reasonable, um, methods to obtain data, be it when there's a, you know, they go to a judge and they get a warrant and, and so on and so forth. They do things through the legal proper channels that are in place to get d data so they could catch bad guys and keep us safer. I don't have any problem with that. Um, even if it may, to some degree, compromise a little bit of my privacy, everybody's going to have a difference of opinion on this one. Um, it's only going to get worse before it gets better, in my opinion, because the bottom line is we are all more connected than we ever were before. Um, years ago, my, I didn't have a connected thermostat that I do now. I didn't have a, a, a video doorbell that I do now. I didn't have a smartphone that has access to um, a family plan connected in with all my other smartphones and cameras and so on and so forth. The list expands. If you look at your, your life and your IOT devices and how wide your, your footprint is, your digital footprint, you really don't have much privacy anymore for a true hacker or bad guy. If they want to go after you, you have to basically throw the electronics throw everything wireless in the garbage to stay safe and stay off the grid or to some degree you, your data is out there bottom line. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Uh, I'm, I'm not a privacy absolutist and I'm not a security absolutist. I think in the real world, we live in the middle in that, in that gray area and you're always pushing, you know, some groups on, you know, that tend to live on one side more than the other side of that scale are pushing one way and the other group is pushing the other yes, way. And yes. you, you got to live in that happy medium. Uh, it just reminds me of a, uh, an analogy I hear often on, uh, I, I listen to a lot of geek tech and security podcasts and they always talk about, um, the people on the, on the privacy side always kind of complain that, they say, well, with the advent of, of smartphones and all of this data, law enforcement has more access legally 
illegally, however they're getting it. They have more access to information on everyone than they had in, you know, than they've ever had in history, you know, a hundred times more than just probably in the past 30 years, be, just because of the smartphone alone. And they, they always liken it to, uh, uh, a surveillance video where you, you have it like you're looking at an HD TV and you have all, you know, these millions of pixels on this TV. And so you're seeing all these kind of pixels of data and there's just one pixel that's dead. And that's the law enforcement is, you know, crying and complaining and trying to get the, the rules changed because of that one. They want that one pixel to light up for them so they could see a whole picture. You know, they, in, in a yes. sense, usually, usually that's usually, that's usually the, um, you know, let's let's decrypt end to end encryption because that would be kind of a major uh, score for law enforcement. They would get conversations, they would get motives, they would get everything they need to make to, for a solid case. But mm -hmm. there would also be many unintended and intended consequences that come of that. I think where you'd have uh, citizens that are innocent would get caught up in this dragnet and and. Then what happens when the law changes and suddenly they go back and say, hey, wait, you you did this. You said this. You were con consorting with this person at that time. And we change, you know, the laws have changed. And so now we're going to prosecute you because we, we can prove that you did this. And, you know, it it just it digs up so many things when you want that uh, absolutist security, you know, law and order state. Uh, uh, yeah that that those are the concerns and and you know likewise the the absolute privacy state well it's a i think it's a thing of fiction because no one is truly off the grid even if you yeah. are off the grid you're still on a grid that can be tracked by someone and if someone wants sure. to track you enough and you know charge you with a crime and then investigate and all those things they can do it it doesn't matter where you live or you know who, who how it doesn't matter how many cell phones you smash and how many SIM cards you remove and batteries you remove, mm -hmm. you can still be tracked through so many other methods. So yeah, I think both extremes are wrong. And, you know, it comes back to just kind of trying to live somewhere in that happy medium. Yeah. I, th I think that there's definitely truth in that. And I, I was thinking just the, the other day, I was actually um, assisting a ongoing investigation that, that entailed, um, sur some surveillance footage and it was interesting because they they brought in a um, cyber forensics expert and while we were doing some things and just waiting for some footage to be downloaded we were just chatting about some some war stories and crazy things this and that and i clearly saw his expertise he has to constantly in law enforcement, stay up to the latest and greatest education on cyber crimes and hackers and threats, but his sheer frustration dealing with large tech companies that that just basically make blanket statements and prevent law enforcement from having access to a lot of things. So they have to get creative and work with other companies to find back doors and exceptions to just collect data and use it to prosecute the bad guys. And I thought it was very interesting um, hearing it from that perspective, the law enforcement, and I felt really bad. And I said, wow, you're, you're trying to do your job and, and do good things to keep people safe. Yet you have a lot of roadblocks and a lot of challenges. And on top of all that, now you have the technical challenges and hurdles. It's true what you said. There are a lot more access to electronic things, but there's a lot of locked doors that they run into in the process. So things that you would think are very simple to do um, become very expensive and very time consuming and tie up uh, the legal system for, for getting basic evidence to use against bad guys for doing things that are just wrong. So there's got to be some, some checks and balances, I think, put in place to streamline some of that that would allow, I would think, a law enforcement to fast track and have access to the the rich data sets that are out there so they can actually solve a crime and take care of something. Um, I think that's important. I, I I was thinking back a number of years ago, you remember, may remember the story. We're in an industrial park and, and the companies have since moved out, but across the street, there were two very large buildings and they received huge spools of copper wire out from the Midwest. And these were giant, giant spools that weigh, you know, several tons. And they had, they put them on big machines that would spool them down to smaller spools of, you know, 25, 50, 100 foot lengths. 
And this was for um, mostly industrial wiring and some home wiring. And they sold to Home Depot, Lowe's, and all the other big box stores. Well, they they had a problem that an employee was, or they didn't know it was an employee or inside job, outside job combination to the two or physical break-in. They didn't know what was going on, but copper just kept disappearing. Wire, tons and tons of it were disappearing. Day in, week in, week out, month in, month out. And this went on for over the course of a year. Um, and then finally, they installed a whole bunch of cameras in the building to see, okay, maybe it was employees stealing it somehow, covering up the sky, couldn't find any trace evidence of it. Um, they called the police. The police came and, and then they said, you know what? I noticed there's cameras at the building across the street and we've got a, a pretty nice camera system and DVR and recorded also and so forth. And the police came over and said, hey, do you guys have cameras facing our building in the street? And I said, yeah, sure. Could we come in and look? We have a, a scenario where large volume of copper wire has been stolen over the past year. We have no idea where, why, how. Can we look at your footage? Sure. So we sat there and it took a while. We went through about an hour or so of scrolling through different days when they had marks, when things were stolen. And guess what? Sure enough, they saw a white pickup truck going in about 1 a.m. And then sometime later, 2 a.m. or something like that, it would drive out and it was filled with copper wire. And they're like, what? How'd they do that? They didn't get in the building. Well, what the guys did, it was an inside job. They drilled a hole in the building. They set these giant spools up right before they left work and they would stick a little feeder outside the building. It was a hole. And they basically would pull up to the building and just start pulling. They'd be pulling until they would empty the reel, cut it, fill the truck up. Next morning, go to the recycler and cash in and make thousands of dollars every morning. And this went on for, I think, the course of almost a year. But the videotape footage, that data, that rich set of data, putting things together with the timestamps, the video, the license plate, the pickup truck, um, figuring out who the employee was allowed them to arrest them. I thought it was fascinating just to be part of it and to see that the the valuable use of timestamps in just video, and we were just videotaping the traffic and our parking lot and other things, really hasn't proven very useful for us, but how it aided in the arrest of a, a criminal across the street um, was very eye-opening to me. So I always applaud people when they um, do set up video cameras, not to spy on people and things, but just to protect yourself because you don't know what might happen or when you might use that as evidence for something to keep you or your loved one safe. Yeah. That reminds me of the, uh, there's a great documentary. I wish I could remember exactly what it was called. It was on, it's on Netflix and it's fairly new. It's all about the, the Boston bombing. Um, oh, okay. I heard they, about that. I didn't see it yet. It's got, you know, it's it's like just like what you were saying, how when you set up a security camera for your own premises, it, it doesn't usually benefit you. It ends up benefiting others because that's how they saw the guys and tracked them and they used multiple cameras and they recreated the whole uh, scenario. And it was fascinating, the, just the forensics that went behind it when you put... And they, they, were, they got lucky, too. There was a lot of lucky breaks that made it possible. But there was also a lot of great detective work. And so when you put all those things together, you know, you end up getting the result. They, they nabbed the two guys within days. And it was it's kind of an amazing story, the, the whole yeah. thing. Um, That's fabulous. Another, another thing um, I just that just reminded me, you were talking before about the uh, customer uh, kind of hitting these legal roadblocks and things. I get this email newsletter. I'm not going to say who it's from. I don't want to give them a free plug because I don't know anything about them. But it's 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 a it's a newsletter for law enforcement and it's training classes. And they specifically target. They have. I'll, I'll read this real quick. Uh, Apple and Google search warrants. So mm -hmm. they they say how to get you know the best way to kind of lubricate the system so that you can get a search warrant so that Apple. And Google and other major companies will, you know, disclose comply. before, you know, comply be forced to disclose this information on a suspect. Mm. They, they have a specific class for Snapchat investigations. <laughs> they have they have one for general, like just social media investigations. Um, let me see, it's Snapchat investigations. This course is intended for all law enforcement officers with an interest in social media investigations, and will focus on Snapchat. Uh, relevant to patrol officers, street crime team members, and investigators working in assignments related to narcotics, firearms, gangs, sex crimes, and violent crimes. So the the tools are out there. Um, all we can hope for is that 
the tools are being used in a legal way uh, and and properly. And I have no problem with that. Uh, it's it's the yeah. you know the guys who try to skirt the law and you know contaminate the chain of evidence and then and then cover it up and lie about it so that you know they can make their case and those kind of things those are you know problematic uh but you know more knowledge and more tools used in a legal way is good for everyone i think yeah i i wholeheartedly agree and i think uh, technology is always going to be misused unfortunately by the bad guys but i think at the same time it's important to embrace technology um, for good purposes and to be used for, for lawful things to, to stop the bad guys from abusing things. And, uh, I, I do see that it typically, the good guys tend to be a little bit lax in the training and knowledge base and focus more on maybe gut or instincts or old school, um, techniques that they've used that have worked for years, but unfortunately things change too quick. I mean, just keeping up with social media, and trying to manage accounts and 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 understanding how they all work is very uh, very cumbersome and very time distracting and and you need experts in the field now to assist law enforcement I think to make their job easier so they can get the information they need so they can do their job properly and 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 I support it wholeheartedly I think it's a it's key these days. Yeah, uh, there is. Um... Well, that about wraps up the stories for this episode. Uh, before we go, just want to check in with you and see uh, what you got coming up. I think you got a big show coming up next week, right? Yeah, I'm excited. I'm going to be heading out to Vegas for a couple of days, um, heading out Tuesday night. Uh, I'm going to be with Cybercrime Magazine and uh, doing some exciting interviews there with some, some CISOs and others in the cyber community at uh, Black Hat in Las Vegas for uh, two days. Uh, I know I'll be interviewing uh, some really exciting people, so certainly stay tuned and listen on uh, Cybercrime Magazine and uh, Cybercrime Radio. They host a lot of these uh, episodes that I'm doing, and uh, some great stuff. Black Hat is always an exciting event. It's a little different, a little more cutting edge maybe than RSA. is a little more, I call it business-minded individuals, a little more polished. Black Hat's a little more edgy perhaps. For, for obvious reasons. And I think that this year too, it may be a little bit, a um, little different also with just the recent passing of Kevin Mitnick. Uh, certainly many people are going to be uh, talking about him. And I think that the good that he's certainly done for the hacking community and the education side going from, I guess, a black hat, black, black hat to a white hat hacker and really educating and, and devoting his life to, to helping people certainly was a sad loss with him passing. And I, I know I've learned personally many things from him uh, reading his books. Just, I remember kicking back one time and just having a drink with him uh, after an event. And we talked for hours about stuff. We just had such a good time trading stories and jokes and things that we reflected back from when we were both children doing things, him and the, and the phone freaking side. And I thought about, I was sharing stuff when, when we were younger with, hacking games, Atari and Apple and all the different crazy antics that we used to do as a, you know, uh, on the bulletin yeah. board systems and the SISOPs and hacking through yeah, the past. He, he was, <laughs> he was your, he was closer to your age, right? Yes, he was. Yeah. yeah I think he's okay. 50, 59. So he was about, about five, six years older than myself, but we really connected and hit it off there with a lot of commonalities and stories. And I think also growing up, knowing a lot of the people, that were influential in our times that were also into that, that kind of scene was interesting to just chat about and talk with them. So I always have fond reflections when uh, I think back to some of those conversations I had and, I, and it was wonderful because I had the privilege of interviewing them on a few occasions as well and different uh, uh, trade shows and events and, and just getting his perspective. And of course he worked at, at no before and uh, had great success there with the, the founder Stu and, and they've done some great things with, I think they're um, fishing awareness and, and, and other types of uh, awareness training to keep people safe in the world of cyber. And they've, they've done, a, done a fair amount over the years. So I highly respect certainly the, the things that they've done from an educational standpoint as well. Yeah. All right. Well, I wouldn't be surprised that there's some sort of memorial or, or you know, gathering remembrance of uh, Kevin Mitnick at the uh, Black Hat. We'll see. Yeah. Um, 
But in the meantime, uh, I, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Dark Kryptonite, once again for stopping ransomware, malware, and phishing by uh, in their tracks by eliminating cybercrime fraud and information warfare. Um, they use advanced blockchain algorithms and zero trust models to accomplish this, and you can learn all about it on darkkryptonite.com. Um, this podcast is available on YouTube, Spotify, Google, iHeart, a- Apple, Amazon, and more. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and review our podcast for questions and comments. You can co- contact us at linktree slash Scott Schober. Uh, you get all his social media things. He's kind of the point of contact uh, for this podcast. Uh, we read your comment, a question on the podcast. We'll send you a choice of signed copy of Hacked Again, Cybersecurity is Everybody's Business, or Senior Cyber. Uh, thanks for listening, and uh, tune in next week for another uh, episode of uh, Cyber Coast to Coast. This is Craig signing off from Costa Rica. All right. Take care there, Craig. Talk to you soon. And this is Scott, co-host, signing off from the East Coast here out of Metuchen, New Jersey. Stay safe, everyone. With your host, Scott and Craig Schober.